Buddy Duty. Uh, as promised, we're back. <laughs> and uh, a Monday morning, the mosquitoes uh, robbed me of a great deal of sleep last night. Is what it is. So, anyway, here we, here, here we go. Um, this week, as I said, I'm going to be doing seascapey type things. Um, and as I had mentioned previously, um, I have got a great deal of, of reference material from the Salt Rock Tidal Pool. So, um, so this week we're going to tackle an aspect of that very place. And, uh, and it's not your average seascape by any means. Um, something completely different in fact. Which is what I like to do. <laughs> so, I'll just let you work it out as we, as we go. Hmm. Where should, where should we begin? Uh, somewhere down here. Mm. Somewhere there. You know what? I'm going to actually use my T-square for this, even though it's not a horizon by any means. There is no horizon. This piece just for a, just for a nice lengthy... No, not even that. I'm going to use my... I'm going to use my uh, shorter ruler just to get a rough line going. Uh, let's see, it's somewhere over there. Not working. It's not working too well, but anyways, gives an freaking idea of sorts. Stupid charcoal is not working properly either. So, well, if we just come back to, if we just come back to freehand, in the hopes that that's the straightest line. Right. Doesn't matter really if it is that much. Uh, and then to about over here. Uh, let me try my steel ruler. That might give me a semblance of a better a better line. Oh, come on, stop it. Goodness gracious. Stubborn bloody thing, hey. Alright, do they? It'll, it'll pass. It will suffice for the purposes of this particular piece. Hmm. Hello, Kit Kat. Hello. Did you come to say hello? Hey? Come and say hello there. Oh, then don't. Uh, there. What do you want then? You don't want to say, you don't get picked up. You don't want to say hello. You don't want nothing. Eh? Say hello to everybody. <laughs> eh? Where have you been? Uh, yeah. Okay. What are you going to be up to now, Kit Kat?
for nothing. Right, we have got this is going to be lots of scribbles to begin with uh, for the most part Slowly you might start to see something emerge. Just a little bit here. What can you say, Kike? What can you tell me? All right, you might start to see a, a semblance of something happening here. Um, we have the, 
the corner of one of the pools, the entrance, um, steps going into the into the into the pool, into the water, and a stainless steel balustrade from the top step leading in. Steps going down, very vague, very sort of full of full of um, CVD stuff and mulchy stuff, and then this bare concrete um, on the side here, stone, um, stone, chips, concrete, whatever. Um, right, so there we have it. Um, that's, the, that's, that's, that, that's the Beningi. <laughs> um, ah, goodness me. Right, so, here we go. You're off again, Kit Kat. Sick of here. Hmm? You're on your bike again. Right. Uh, Alright, see ya. So today, we obviously just established composition. Now, said composition is fairly well established, I'd say, at this point. Um, and So the, apparently, for what I have managed to determine, um, a gentleman by the name of Basil Hewlett, um, obviously from the Hewlett's sugar family of the last century, and and prior to that, um, big big name in sugar in sugar farming in KwaZulu Natal. Um, we still have, even to this day, we still have Hewlett's sugar, and and it's obviously one of the family members. One of the, perhaps perhaps the, perhaps the main. I I'm not very au okay fait with um, with all of that. Um, um, as as to who the families were and what they did and when they were and all that sort of stuff um but by and large it is it appears as as, as if basil i keep wanting to say basil, basil faulty um no not basil faulty um basil hewlett um was this was the chap who Actually, let's just erase that. Um, who built, envisaged and built this wonderful tidal pool series, series of tidal pools and and uh, and fishermen's perches at uh, Umslali Beach, Salt Rock, back in the nineteen thirties which is quite some time back um, so so this this system of pools and what have you has been here for ooh, the best part of nearly a hundred years and And they have provided, I'm sure, endless entertainment for kids, for families, over the generations, many generations. Um, that's all wrong. I don't want that like that. Yes, Kit Kat. 
it's exactly how I how I feel. Um, yeah, so these series of tidal pools, and it's really wonderfully done. Um, they're, they're sort of different levels, different pools, some pouring into others, little walkways. There's a there's a large tower turret or whatever that 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 obviously was used for predominantly for fishing off of so that that stands high up above the high up above the rocks so that the fishermen can cast into the into the directly into the gullies um, and uh, and obviously very sort of castle like so you know kids imagination must have and still probably does. In fact, the kid in me still, my, the kid in me still runs wild in terms of imagination. Please stop. You don't need to be fussing with stuff, Kit Kat. Um, I'm not liking this, what's going on here. I'm not liking this at all. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not concentrating. You see what happens? I'm busy with my composition part of this thing and I am talking and I'm not concentrating and focusing on what I'm doing. So, yeah, you see? All right, let's get this back again. Let's get this back again. That little bugger is in the wrong place. Right. See, now this is where I use my eraser for what it's meant to be used for. It doesn't really matter because I've got a lot of cast shadow and and refraction reflections and what have you going on in this in this whole area. So just adjusting this at this point is immaterial. Um, at least I have the, the gist of it. Right, that's that. That's that sorted out. And now I have steppies. Yeah, so then there's, there's, there's also some little little walkways and little piers that were built that were that led out to other um, little s s uh, points above the water where fishermen could go and perch. But those some of those have been washed away over, over, over the last 90 years odd. Um, barrels that had been filled with concrete um, and as pillars and then this sort of rickety walkway to another little perch at the it's been fascinating um, how all this was was envisaged I mean we're talking 1930s there was nothing out that way it wasn't even a resort a resort at that point it was just a 
perhaps a place where families, perhaps sugar cane, sh sugar farmers and their families could go to the beach, spend some time. The kids, it was, it was too much of a journey for anyone from coming through from Durban. It was just a, an impossibility. It would be, it would have been a, it would have been at least a day trip or more just to get there. <laughs> um, back in the 1930s that's for sure uh, there might have been a road there would have been a road that that would have that would have gone up the north coast um, and uh, so I guess possible to to, to, to to get there but not I I think I think I'm not sure when the the campsite was built because there's a campsite adjoining sort of well the on the the land side of the of this complex of tidal pools, um, and and uh, you know that's that's a sort of campsite, but that's much much more recent, I would imagine. Um, back in those days, there were there might have been a but obviously, as I've mentioned before, sugarcane farming was huge in this region um, for many, many decades. A huge, a huge commodity, and 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 most of the most of the land in KwaZulu Natal, uh, especially especially nearer towards the the, the coast, um, was sugarcane. Uh, and still is to a large degree but as I've been as I've been um, ranting about last in my last episode um, you know a lot of that or most of that the cane fields now are being sold off by the the likes of Hewlett's and well Tonga Hewlett group um, are being sold off as res residential and commercial um, land. So now that uh, you'll you'll find if you drive up the north coast now, you'll find a lot of land that is just standing fallow, um, that is just basically growing weeds and grass and stuff like that, as opposed to sugarcane and well controlled and all of that sort of thing. So these vast tracts of land are now just standing obviously awaiting development anyway as I said I'm not going to rant about that again um, well I might I might not <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a few days to get through <laughs> excuse me um, <clears throat> all right and uh, Yes, but so, so these, these uh, tidal pools were obviously developed as places of leisure. Um, perhaps perhaps uh, in, in, in a joint sense where perhaps the uh, indentured labourers could come and fish from. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, back in those days um, or whether it was purely for the for the farmers and their families and whoever else happened to be in the in the area um, but by and large um, this place was built as a, as a as a source of entertainment and leisure and pleasure um, so and wonderfully done wonderfully executed um there's another tidal pool a smaller one um at sharkers rock and it's about maybe a kilometer south of this point um yeah so lots and lots of them all the way up and down the coastline well not so much that many more further further north um as we head towards zululand etc but um but as we as we head towards Durban um, and then from Durban south down the south coast 
also lots and lots of um, tidal pulls um, and then we hit then we hit the um, what used to be the Transkei, the Wild Coast, which was very tribal um, and also very um, quite desolate um, in terms of um, really rugged, rugged coastline. So that wasn't it wasn't really a resorty type of type of place, especially when it was too far to travel, um, too difficult to get there. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, South Africa's, I forget how many tidal pools there are or have been over the, over the decades along South Africa's, well, a stretch of perhaps Southern Africa, um, uh, 3,000 kilometers or so. Um, I forget the numbers now, but uh, a significant number of, uh, of tidal pools and, and whatever that have been built some some more rough and ready than others and uh, obviously taking into account the the uh, surrounding landscape usually set next to a swim, swimming beach uh, where there was a rocky outcrop and they used the rocks to to kind of then then build up with slabs of concrete or whatever to to retain some water that would then be the name tidal pool became became such due to the pool being filled up at high tide and then slowly started to start to uh, reduce again and then the next high tide would fill up again as the waves came over so it, it they were well judged in terms of their height so there was a medium where they were just below the high tide mark, um, well, the waves from the high tide mark that would then crash over, fill up, and then it would slowly drain and seep, seep out, uh, but not completely, obviously. So by the time the next tide turned, um, it would then be sufficiently, you know, just need topping up all the time. spring tides and what have you were different where these perhaps these pools were completely completely filled in um, but by and large created to to provide a safe swimming area for kids and grannies <laughs> who are the adults and older kids went to go and frolic in the surf Right. This is going to be a um, little bit of greens uh, for the mossy kind of uh, area on the stairs beneath the waterline. Um, a kind of a well, almost bare paper color for the uh, for the uh, for the outer edge of the uh, pool surrounding the pool. Um, a little bit of blue for reflection of sky and and what have you so it's going to be a 
I have a kind of a gentle um, um, colorway. Just want to get the basics of these trends of these kind of ripples and shadow patterns. Lots of light play. Lots and lots of light play here. Um, little intricate ripples and funny things going on. So that will that will evolve as we as we continue with this piece. simple piece in actual fact um, fairly straightforward fairly plain um, quite sort of I want to, I'm looking for that um, that very architectural content to it in other words solid concrete um, defined lines etc but those under the water those defined lines become blurrier you know what I mean? Because we've got this, uh, we've got this kind of ripples on the water surface. We've got reflect refracted light and reflected light uh, shadows playing on the on the on the under surface on the uh, the bottom of the pool where the steps go in. In fact, this is mostly just steps that are just go I've got this very this this neat little corner um, of perhaps ah. Oh, Oh, I don't know, three by four meters um, type of thing in, in terms of area um, with this with this little balustrade that, that, that runs into the water under the surface um, so that little old ladies can hold on to when they when they take go for a dip um, <laughs> kids or whatever <laughs> Yeah, so you can find a few of these all around, dotted around the place. Um, and, up, and there's another couple of, another different one, different side, different angle, different lighting, which I'd also like to tackle. Um, I have done one of these pieces like this before. And that was at Belito Tidal Pool. In fact, <laughs> two tidal pools down the coast. Um, also with a similar balustrade, stainless steel, polished, highly polished, um, above the water surface <coughs> and uh, beneath the water surface not so much. Um, so I, I, I've tackled something similar but not quite the same. Um, so these things intrigue me I, and, and I, do the, I do things that intrigue me. I enjoy doing that sort of thing. So that's why I do what I do and not for any other reason other than that. Um, these tidal pools have become a rather a fascination for me in terms of their in terms of their structure, how they were put together, why they were put together, um, the factors that were that were taken into account when when uh, constructing them, etc. How they were constructed. Um, <coughs> yes, gracious, these mosquitoes are just. I have to do a. I have to do a little bit of a, a cleansing, <laughs> a little bit of a purge at some point. 
<laughs> just can't try and get rid of these things because they just they just one at a time waited for me all night long for me to just begin to drift off to sleep and then I get this zzz. Ah. can't tell you how how irksome it is and how tiring it is because you got to kind of just oh, man so difficult that, that, that sometimes they don't even bite, but they just that sound is just if you can't sleep, cannot sleep, and they they seem to know they seem to know to wait until you're just about to drift off into sleep, and then they make a beeline for your ear. And then you're waking up again, and then you're slapping at yourself and trying to, and then you, and then you're awake, and then you slowly drift off to sleep, and then another one comes in. <laughs> yeah, that's been my night. It's not going to happen tonight, that's for sure. And I'm going to do a proper purging of these damn things and try and find the source of them. Um, I had found it before. In a, in a in a hole in the middle of my in the middle of my lawn that they were getting into that had obviously got some water inside there that had, that had stagnated and they were breeding in there so they're finding somewhere else to breed now and I don't like that I've got to, I've got to oh, I don't I don't know where I've got to find it so that's my mission for today <laughs> Get rid of the dang mozzies. really don't know how this is going to turn out actually um, <laughs> might be a dog's breakfast I don't know anyway that is it may Over here on the edge, just yeah. So we've got some greens, a few yellows, some blues. Pools, each pool's lighting seems to be different. Um, obviously, because of the angle that that I am capturing the images from, etc. But also their depth. Um, what is underneath? What is the what, what is the uh, the basis? In other words, here there's concrete steps leading in, and then probably sand more towards the left over there. Other other most of these pools though. The majority is just this, this sandy bottom, yellowy. Sometimes they, the deeper they are, the greener they are, of course, and then as it shallows out, so it becomes yellower. Um, so yeah, I want to capture as many of these kind of different angles and what have you. I hate to... I'm loath to use the word abstract, but they are quite abstract in terms of their, in terms of their essence. Um, if 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 you if, you've, if you don't know what a tidal pool is, and if you don't if you don't recognise what's going on, it's you'll just see something that is a fairly abstract concept. This weird balustrade with these strange coloured steps going into a pool and 
you know, this, this, this pole, this metal, bright metal pole um, with these angular, this angular corner with these rugged, rugged concrete. Um, it's not like a normal um, public swimming pool um, where it's nicely tiled and perfect edges and, and what have you, white tiles and what have you. This is a, this is a tidal pool. This is a, this is something that is open to the elements and to the, to the surf and the ocean for its entire lifespan. Um, so from the day it's built, it becomes vulnerable. There's no, and there's no um, filtration system other than just the natural way that, that, that things occur. Um, so this is this is seawater. It's just and replenished by the sea. It's as simple as that. Um, so there's no chemicals and there's no balancing pH levels and all this kind of thing, and, and as you would find in a, in a public swimming pool. Um, so there's a ruggedness to this as well. Um, and they had to be rugged to last this long. Gee whiz. <clears throat> there was. There seems to be the remnants of some kind of a pump system um, with the big, big wheels that you, a wheel that you turn to obviously allow flow. I don't know. I, I don't know what the, what the uh, thinking behind that was, but there they, they, they are remnants of these rusted old, old valves. Um, I don't know what those would have been for. Maybe my mental meanderings will unearth something, I don't know. Anyway, so today's really just about establishing our composition and, and basic light and shade areas which is pretty much what we've got now. <clears throat> now, so using my eraser to great effect with this piece, I'm sure. I do keep saying that, but I think I have a feeling I'll need it quite a lot more in this piece than I have in others. Bastard! <laughs> well, and for those of you who don't know, um, Durban is a, a very subtropical climate um, and there's a lot of lush vegetation all around and, and pretty much most of the year um, we have middle temperatures um, usually in the mid to late 20s into the 30s in summer, etc. But we have quite a huge, quite a large, uh, there's a humidity, humidity factor pretty much throughout the year. Um, during winter, not so much, but definitely as we head towards now, heading towards summer again, um, the humidity starts to increase. And, and obviously, with any water that sits in, and, and now is kind of a raise, we're get heading into a rainy season as well, so we get um, a lot of water that sits stagnant, fills up little spots in trees and uh, little drains and things like that. And that's where the mozzies breed, that's where the mosquitoes breed, and uh, not much you can do about that. Um, other than hope that dragonflies descend upon them. Because apparently mosquitoes are a favorite of dragonflies. 
something I didn't know before. That uh, and it's perhaps why you quite often see a, 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 I see like a cloud of, of uh, dragonflies hovering over my lawn and darting back and forth. And that was when there was this this hole that was found that uh, that was a breeding spot for mosquitoes. So obviously the uh, mosquitoes were starting to emerge, and then the and then the dragonflies would then descend on them and, and eat them. Um, pity that dragonflies aren't around at night though, because <laughs> that's when I need them the most. Man, I need some pet dragonflies in my room at night. Or chameleons or something. I Anyway. Yeah. She'll have to try and make a plan of sorts going forward. So these were very much colonial days um, in terms of the, uh, obviously the Hewlett family was maybe from, originally from the, from England. Uh, they had these vast tracts of land that they would farm for sugar. So a very much a a uh, colonial farming um, heritage in this in, in all the way up this north coast up as far as as far as Zululand and they would have had their concessions from from the Zulu kings along the way um, up to a point where they were kind of I think Ketswaya was the last was the last of the the Zulu kings to be uh, to have any kind of sway. Um, I think that Queen Victoria put paid to him eventually. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so the sugar barons of the of the of this KwaZulu Natal region, um, and the Hewlett's were probably the, probably the biggest family. Of, uh, of the region, or held the most, had the most land. Um, they have got, there is a huge palace in, in Durban that, that was once the, uh, the, the, the home of, of the Hewlett family, um, that is now kind of an office complex really, but very, very colonial in terms of its architecture great big white columns and red brick with turrets and all sorts of things. A very, very grand um, home, very close to what, very close to what was called, once called King's House, which was the place where the, uh, the, 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 the reigning monarch would, would live, would stay when visiting Durban. And of course, Natal, was the primary outpost for uh, for the British. Durban being the well, M Peter Maritzburg is is the capital, but uh, and uh, it's, but Durban was became much more established, and that was where things were happening. So all the well-to-do had their grand homes in Durban, many of them still around today, the homes that is, not the people, um, and uh, yeah, those were the days of the real, the real wealthy, lifestyles of the rich and famous.
Fascinating though, I find always. So this is this piece is very, it's very graphic to begin with, very scratchy and very indistinct, but it'll start to come together slowly. Don't you worry. For those of you who are prone to worrying about these things. Yeah. Um, so quite a tranquil little setting this as well. Um, it, 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 it kind of, uh, what I'd like to do is embody the kind of, uh, the tranquility of this place, the calmness, the serenity, um, exactly exemplifying what a tidal pool is all about. Just providing that that calm space, easy to access um, amidst the surrounding violent um, ocean action. Um, so that's what really what this piece is about. It's just this little corner of access into the pool. Um, you can imagine some a few kids, maybe a, maybe an old granny with a little uh, floral um, swimming cap on, making her ponderous way into the pool. Um, <laughs> not to be flustered. But easy access to go and wallow. Almost you can see where the where the uh, concrete has been poured into these slabs, um, and slowly over the years, the water gushing over the top has eroded away part of that to leave some kind of patterns and exposed rock chips, stone chips and what have you that were part of the construct of the uh, of the uh, pool surrounds, the concrete surrounding the pools and forming the walls, the edges, the steps and what have you, um, by and large. And very much bleached over the over the many decades bleached by the sun exposed by the wave action how many countless people have taken these steps <laughs> over the last hundred years How many kids? How many? How many little old ladies? <laughs> how many like me, <laughs> for that matter? I just become 
fascinated by the the history of these places and and then I start to think about times and times and space when um, and, and how they did things perhaps differently how, how they did things the same I mean this is a place of leisure. You come here, you splash about in these pools and run around screaming as kids and building sandcastles on the beach next to the, you know, uh, and that's just pretty much the same always. The imagination of kids um, is much the same when it comes to these simple things. There aren't any, there aren't any um, <sighs> iPads and and things. This is where it gets where kids can just play as they've always played. Basic, raw entertainment. Just the joy of living. The joy of playing in the water, in the sand, a respite from the technological world. And you even see adults having fun at places like this still it's just a it's just such a, a wonderful and easy getaway from 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 life from from not from life but from from the business world from the our day-to-day -day drudgery school work all of that, just getting in the sun, taking in those that vitamin D, um, healthy in the water. Blowing the cobwebs out, whatever it is. Just standing on top of one of these towers and watching the waves crash at your feet, beneath your feet and uh, Cascading, you can stand there and watch that for hours. It is wonderful. And there I was with my, with my camera trying to dodge the waves, trying to dodge the, the spray as the tide turned to capture some 400 images, <laughs> 412 to be exact. And as I've said, I had a, I have about 50, 56, I think, images that are worthy of artistic representation. Um, many of which I won't get get around to doing it um, in the long run. But let's see. Let's see in time to come. Um, you know, obviously with the tranquility of this, of this piece, there is also, there's movement, there's shifting light and there's, there's ripples and there's, and there's also this solid solidity, this, uh, of the concrete and the, and the, and the sort of dainty, yet almost um, discordant silver stainless steel pole in the middle of it all. <laughs> anyway, that's a good start. I think we're done for today. Um, so uh, yes, thank you for bearing with me for this first uh, for this first session of this week's piece. And uh, and thank you for listening. <laughs> I hope it's been as 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 interesting a little journey as 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 it is for me to start to, 
yeah, this is, these are my little voyages of discovery um, where I start to unpack things and unpack ideas, maybe have a rant or two here and there. Um, um, but uh, these are, this is my journey and uh, I'm glad to have those of you who enjoy it as a part of it. Uh, so do bring in some new subscribers for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, oodles and oodles of toodles and see you again on the morrow. Uh, so have a fantastic day ahead and uh, be good, be safe, be kind and uh, take it easy. Bye folks. And don't forget to doodle.